Hey guys, so in the last episode, we showed you how to get started quickly with Pixie.js using the Pixie application helper class. So in this episode, I wanna dive into the different classes and objects that this helper class is creating for you so that we understand them a bit better. So let's dive in. But let's first take a look at the history of Pixie.js to understand the context within which it was created and where it's heading. Around the time Pixie.js first came out, Canvas was everywhere and WebGL was just starting to spread to other browsers. But there were still some holdouts, particularly on mobile. Because of this, it was really important for the library to work well on both 2D Canvas and WebGL. If we compare this with the current state of the web, WebGL is ubiquitous, even going back a couple browser versions. Also, WebGL2 is starting to spread across browsers. Given that Pixie.js is all about performance, it seems clear that the future of high-performance graphics on the web is with WebGL and WebGL2. They've reflected this in their version 5 roadmap by making the default build and renderer to be exclusively WebGL or WebGL2 where supported. The canvas render is still available in a separate legacy build. I mentioned this because version 5 is very close to release and that's what we'll be focusing on in this series. So if you remember in our last episode, we used the Pixie.js application helper class, and this is great because it covers a lot of boilerplate code that we don't otherwise have to build, but we wanna go in and understand those different parts of the application in more detail. So I'm gonna go through and remove all our references to Pixie application. So the first thing we're gonna create is our renderer. And this takes the same attributes you would just pass into your Pixie application class. So we're gonna pass in the view, which is our canvas, as well as our width and height, which we're setting to the windows inner width and height. You can also pass in a bunch of other parameters here, such as the background color or set transparent to true so that your canvas element will be transparent and allow you to see things underneath it. The next thing we're going to create is our stage. And this is really just the root container of all our objects within our scene that we're going to pass into our renderer. Because we were using our renderer's width and height to position our sprite at the center of our screen, we need to again reference our renderer here. So I'm just going to update that. Then we need to add our sprite to the stage we created. The last new object that we need is our ticker. So we create a new pixie ticker, and then we're going to add our animate method to it so that it'll run at an interval. And then we simply call start. Now we don't need to actually manually call this start because the ticker will start once it has an event listener added to it. It also has other met methods like stop or add once if you want something to fire only one time instead of uh, every request animation frame. The last thing we need to do is inside our animation loop call render on our renderer, passing in the stage object we created. And if we test this, it should be exactly what we had before. So we have our guy spinning in the middle of our stage. So now I'll just go through quick and remove all our references to Pixie application that we commented out. Next, I wanna go through and make a couple changes to our renderer so that we can have it work on retina devices, so higher density displays, as well as make it responsive so that it's resizable. The first thing we need to do is set the resolution on the renderer so that it's set to the Windows device pixel ratio. This will multiply the size of the renderer by the resolution. Next, we can set auto density to true, and this will make sure that through CSS, it'll scale it back down to make sure it fits within the defined width and height that we've set. So now we should be good on retina devices. The next thing I wanna do is make it responsive. So we need to add an event listener to the Windows resize event. And I'm going to make a resize handler called resize. And then I'm gonna go through and create some variables for the Windows width and height, just so we can reference them elsewhere if we need to. So now I'm going to update these variables inside our resize handler and then call resize on our renderer passing in the new width and height. 
So there's one last thing we have to change and that's updating the position of our sprite within our renderer. So I'm gonna move the positioning of our sprite inside the animation loop so it'll update on each frame and this means that as we resize our window it'll reposition our sprite to the center. We also need to change it from renderer width to renderer screen width and screen height. And this will ensure that it's the same on retina and non-retina devices. So now if we test this out, you'll see everything looks the same, but if we resize the window, you'll see our sprite stays in the center of the screen. So whatever size it is, it stays in that position. And this also works on retina devices too now. So that's it for this episode. Hopefully you guys have a better understanding of the objects and classes used inside of your basic Pixie.js application. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.